All right, so we're in this uh, this book, Tactics, Game Plan for Discussing Your Christian Convictions. It's by Greg Kolkel. And last week, we went over the first model question uh, for getting into conversations uh, about your faith, or really any kind of difficult conversation that you want to jump into, or maybe just light step into, maybe not jump. I don't know. Maybe you want to jump in with both feet. That's totally cool too. But it's easy to start a conversation with questions. So a uh, couple, of, couple of review things. Uh, we talked about a different mindset, different mindset. So your goal is not necessarily to get to the gospel. Now, ultimately, that is your goal. But when you're starting a conversation, when you're getting into it, that's not necessarily your goal. I want you to have a more modest goal. Or Greg Kokel, that's what he suggests. And I think, I think he's on to something. Your goal is to learn and to see where the conversation goes. You have no idea where this person is at spiritually. You have no idea. You don't have enough information. Uh, you could share the gospel, but maybe the soil isn't ready to, to receive it. So asking some questions, seeing where the person is, you can get into a more productive conversation. It's a minimalist approach. So here's what you should think. I'm going to take one step, and I'm going to reassess the whole situation. And by taking one step, I mean I'm going to ask a question, see what comes back. You're going to get a bunch back, and you're going to go, hmm, this person seemed like they're <clears throat> maybe open for this conversation, maybe not. Maybe they're just shutting me down really hard. Or maybe... Maybe they're curious. Maybe they're asking more questions. Maybe they're, they want to get into it. <clears throat> that's, that's, you're gaining information as you're asking questions. Um, so what you should be thinking is, I'm going to take one step and then reassess. Um, I teach this in our rescue scenarios at work. So if somebody ends up on the climbing wall, they're 45 feet up in the air, and they're not attached to anything. Oh, I wish you wouldn't have got yourself in that situation. This is your emergency, not my emergency, but I'm here to help. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to stop and see what kind of stuff do I have. Well, if I'm going to go up there, I'm going to need a Belair. So I need to go grab a Belair. Oh, I need equipment. I need to go grab, uh, you know, the equipment that I need to do the whole rescue thing. <clears throat> cool. Like I'm taking a step, reassessing what I've got. And it's like, cool, I'm on the wall. I'm going up. Oh, I don't want to be directly underneath them. If they let go of the wall, they're going to land on my head and then probably kill me. So I'm going to climb over here and then climb over and then do the thing that I need to rescue them. Oh, man. Hey, you know what? Front row. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Here we go. Here we go. Getting comfy. Very good. Welcome, welcome. But the whole time, as I'm going up, maybe I can't reach the next hole to get to them. I need to reassess what I'm doing. Did I climb up this side and I have to swing over? Well, if I swing over and knock them off the wall, that's going to be bad. Like I need to reassess every moment that I make a choice. Every time you ask a question in one of these conversations, that's a choice and that's a time to reassess the situation. So that's all you need to worry about is what's the next step. Because the Holy Spirit's there working as well. And you're just showing up to see what the Holy Spirit's going to do with what you're doing. So it's your task to get into these conversations, but it's God's responsibility to change the heart. It's not your responsibility to change anyone's heart. So put a pebble in their shoe. Even if the conversation doesn't get to a point where you get to share the gospel and it's you know, a clear gospel presentation, that's okay. Maybe you gave them something to think about and the next time you have that conversation or the next time somebody else has a conversation with them, they'll be a little bit more primed for that conversation. <clears throat> and they'll be led slowly spiritually towards the Lord. Give them something to think about. If a pebble's in your shoe, you're going to notice it as you walk on it. It's going to annoy you. That's, that's the approach. So you have about 10 seconds to respond when somebody throws out a wild claim. Somebody throws out something and it's like, do I want to step into this or don't I? a choice right and if you if you want to if you're like okay next time i hear some some claim like that 
I'm already deciding right now that I'm going to ask a question. That's good. Decide beforehand. And that's all you have to do. Maybe you just decide, I'm going to ask one question. And that's it. See what happens. And then that's all you have to do. And we, what was the model question that we had from last week? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? So maybe that, so let's have that be your one question. Okay. It's like, I'm going to decide to ask that one question. They're going to say whatever they're going to say. And even if, the, if it's the first time you're using that question in this kind of situation, you ask it once and go, oh, okay, that's interesting. And that's it. And the next time you'll go, well, that wasn't so scary. It's just some person with ideas. They're not my ideas. They're their ideas. And they're wrong. But that doesn't affect me. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's okay. They can be wrong. Or they could be right. Maybe they have a nuance of an idea that you never even explored. And then they share it and you go, huh, maybe I need to think about that. Always learning. Always learning. So you have about 10 seconds before the door to conversation closes. And you probably have many concerns in your head, right? You want to be sensitive. Maybe it's a sensitive topic, right? You want to keep the peace with the relationship. Maybe preserving friendships is going on in your head. And you don't want to look too extreme. Ah. <sighs> All of those things can be factors that might freeze you in the situation. But you use this question, then they have to do the talking. It takes the pressure off you on having to think of what to say. If you already have a question in your head. You already know what to say. To ask a question. And then the other person has to do the responding. Now, they might respond with a question, which means you're going to have to provide a response. That's how conversations work. But if you already have the question in your head, then cool. You're ready to already enter into that conversation. What do you mean by that? Vocal in his book, <clears throat> page 47, he says, go on the offensive in an inoffensive way by using carefully selected questions to productively advance the conversation. What this does is you have confidence to start the conversation. It minimizes awkwardness, it engages the person gracefully and productively, and you have a plan for the next step because you're just asking a series of questions. A lot of times it's just clarifying questions. Like, oh, what do you mean by that? And they tell you, and it's like, so did you mean this or this? Oh, no, no, I meant that. It's like, oh, okay, now I understand where you're coming from. I actually agree with you. Just the way you said it at the first, I didn't understand what you were talking about. Like, thanks for clarifying. So this is where we get to apply this question. And if you've already read this, then uh, I'll ask you to keep it to yourself. All right, I'm going to read the, there are these scenarios that he has in uh, chapter three. And what I want you to be thinking is, how can I apply that question to this scenario? And these are all scenarios from his life. Pretty interesting. I'm just going to read them. Uh, I'm going to just barrage you with, oh my gosh, what? Ah, ah, and then we'll go through them one by one. So scene one or challenge one, you're hosting a dinner party at your home for some of your close friends from church. The conversation ranges naturally over a number of interesting spiritual topics. Suddenly, to your surprise and embarrassment, your 15-year-old son announces with some belligerence that he doesn't believe in God anymore. It's simply not rational, he says. There's no proof. You had no idea he'd been moving in this direction. Just stunned silence. What will you say? <laughs> uh, uh, hold on, hold on. So, so. But we got to fill in the blank. What is that? So hang on, hang on to that question, right? Like, so that is a points to something else. So we'll, we'll get to scene two. <laughs> You're out of your mind. So notice that wasn't a question. <laughs> that was, neither of those were questions. Are you those are, are you like, there you go, forming a question. There you go. <laughs> I don't believe in you. <laughs> Do you exist? All right. <laughs> All right, scene two. Uh, it's the night of your weekly Bible study group. 
During the discussion of the Sunday Sermon on the Great Commission, a newcomer remarks, Who are we to say Christianity is better than any other religion? I think the essence of Jesus' teaching is love, the same as all religions. It's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe. The rest of the group fidgets awkwardly. How do you respond? I need to just go over the Great Commission again, right? Did, did you miss this? Like, this is what Jesus said. What do you think? Hmm, okay. Yes, we get, okay. We're, yes, hang on to that. That's good. All right. Um, scene three. You're riding the university shuttle with a friend who notices a Bible in your backpack. I've read the Bible before, he says. It's got some interesting stories, but people take it too seriously. It's only written by men, after all. Men make mistakes. You try to recall the points your pastor made a few weeks ago, or a few weeks earlier, about the Bible's inspiration, but come up empty-handed. Okay. Scene four. You're sitting in a car dealer watching TV and watch, uh, waiting with other customers for your car to be serviced. The television news program highlights religious groups trying to influence important moral legislation. Christians. The person next to you says, haven't these people ever heard of the separation of church and state? Those Christians are always trying to force their views on everyone else. You can't legislate morality. Why don't they just leave the rest of us alone? Other people are listening. You don't want to create a scene, but you feel you must say something. What's your next move? So those are the... Those are the <laughs> All right, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a quick, a quick stab. Yeah. Real quick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe in the arm. In the arm. You know, flesh wound. Not too bad. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Because you can't legislate morality. Right. Yeah. There's nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Is murder moral? I don't know. Is there legislation against murder? <laughs> right, right. Yes. Uh, attempted murder? Eh, you'd have to prove motive. It's just a, yeah. It's just assault. Their arm. I'm not trying to. <laughs> <laughs> no intent. Right. The vital organs in the arm. Yeah. I just want to watch you bleed. <laughs> all. all right. So here's the first. Here's a, yeah, yeah. Here's <laughs> Here's a, here's a like summation or the important part or what the person said, okay? So here it is. The son says he doesn't believe in God anymore. It's simply not rational. There's no proof. He had no idea he's moving in that direction. What do you say? So notice there's a couple of claims here. Making a claim. So if you were to ask, what do you mean by... What would you fill in the, the blank with, with the word that? What are you going to point to? <coughs> ah, what do you mean by no proof? Not rational. Yeah, what do you mean by irrational? So another way to phrase that, the first question, what do you mean by, well, actually, no, by uh, proof. Like, what do you mean by proof? What counts? as proof because if they go well i need scientific proof for god that's a category error you can't do a repeatable experiment experiment on god that's just the wrong category you can't do that there's other kinds of proof. There's historical. There's philosophical argument. There's even arguments from Revelation, which is what we have in the Bible. But if none of those count as proof, then you're at a dead end and there's no, there's no conversation there. Because what they say counts as proof, they've already selected off a little chunk of human knowledge and then said everything else is irrelevant. There's no conversation there. Now, you might be able to point out, hey, you've cut yourself off 
from all of this information and knowledge and just go, that's the pebble in the shoe that you need. Really? Or ask another, like, are you looking for absolute proof? Like, a, like, a, a, like in geometry, right? Where you have a proof. It necessarily has to be that way. Or are you looking for proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Proof based on the preponderance of evidence? Like, did that, is this the best explanation for all of this evidence? Is that the kind of proof you're looking for? Like, what are you, what are you looking for exactly? What counts as proof? And then, wait. And if they go, well, uh, they'll probably get silence for a while. It's like, and then if you go, well, you know, did you mean this? Now, I have all this already prepared, right? I've already given some thought to this. So like right now, it's like, oh, yeah, you would ask that in the moment? No, I'd probably be in stunned silence for about a few seconds. And then I would be like, oh, do I want to say something? And I'd have to make that choice and then maybe launch a question. But if you're going to say, what do you mean by proof? Another way to phrase that would be, what would count as proof? And you're just trying to get more, because if they give you that answer, then you know where the conversation could go. You could spend a whole bunch of time trying to give proof that doesn't meet their standard, and then it doesn't do anything. But if you gather that information, now you know where the conversation can go. What about, it's irrational. So what does irrational mean? <coughs> or maybe, maybe you don't know the definition. What would be an example of something that's irrational? <laughs> you said stabbing somebody uh, in the arm, yeah, for no reason. So the idea of, of something being rational or irrational, something is rational if you can give reasons for it. It's irrational if you have no evidence or no reason for why you believe that, right? It's irrational to believe in leprechauns. Right? But is God the same as leprechauns? What do, what do you mean by no? <laughs> I mean, no. How did, how did you reach that conclusion? Oh, that's next week. We're getting into next week. Sorry. So, right. So how, another way to phrase this question would be, how is theism at odds with good thinking? Are there good arguments for theism? Yes, there are. None of them might come to your head, or maybe one illustration might come to your head. It's like, what should come to mind is like, oh, creation demands a creator. Simple. That's, it's reasonable to believe that there's a creator because the universe began to exist. Everything that begins to exist has to have a cause. Yeah, definitely. Yes, David. Right here. Wow. He was not planted here for this class. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time I met him. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the guy in the, in the book. Yeah. Hmm? I argue. Right. Need either position.
instead of um, instead of asking them. What is the reason? Right. Galilee is free and Yep. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, um, atheists believe in something, right? So anyone who makes a claim, if they make a claim, they should have something to substantiate the claim. If they don't, then then they're they're being they're leaning more towards irrationality. Don't have a they might have a reason, but it might not be a, a reason that actually supports the claim. Now, an atheist can, <clears throat> what kind of claim are they making? What's their positive position? So the negative position is like, I, I don't believe in God, right? That's a, that's a negative position, right? Or I, I lack belief in a God, negative position. But what's their positive position? It's like, I do believe in the scientific method or uh, naturalism. All that, all that we can see, touch, taste, test, all those things, that's what's real. Anything that can't be done that way is not real. There's a, there's a positive position that they're taking, and then you try and formulate questions to get deeper into that positive form. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't believe. Why? So it's almost like there's this, tell me if this, uh, if this fits. So because of Romans 1, uh, 19 and on, uh, it talks about how they suppress the knowledge of God in their unrighteousness. One, right? So it's almost as if there is this baseline where everybody has a certain level of, of knowledge, God is, but then they suppress it or they cover it over with something else. Right, so then they go, oh, well, I don't. Okay, well, and when that's suppressed, the way that I like to illustrate that, I got this from someone online, but it's like taking an inflatable beach ball and you're in a pool and you're trying to push it under the water, you're trying to suppress it under the water. Now, because it's full of air, it wants to be buoyant and stay on top of the water. So they have to, they have to have put effort into suppressing that knowledge. And then you come along and just poke. They're holding it down. It's like, no, no, I don't believe. And you just like, oh, poke. Poke. Stop it. Stop it. I want to hold this down. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's like you said. I'm angry with God. Or a lot of times it's not that they're angry with God. They're angry with God's people. How God's people have treated them. Yeah. And then they go, they make the leap from, I'm angry and upset and I hate God's people, and so I hate God. Now, there could be a little bit of separation there. Maybe that's a, another avenue in, but I don't know. Yes, sir. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> right, yeah. If they, they play poorly, like. Don't. Right. Yep. And you judge a worldview based on, uh, based on Christ, not based 
based on the Christians. Now, they will, they're going to, your behavior towards them will influence their perception of it. Very, you have to be careful with how you ask these questions and how you present the information that you're presenting. But at the same time, it's between them and God. So, yeah, yeah. Creation. Right. Yeah, it's a step closer, right? Yeah, it's the pebble in the shoe. Pebble in the shoe. Yes, bro. Right, yeah. So, so in that way, that's an illustration of a way of life that might be different from them, that maybe they've never even considered. Could be, could be the pebble, yeah, right. Um, so it could be, what do you mean by God, right? I don't believe in God. Like, well, what kind of God do you reject? Right, it's not right. I reject the the old man in the sky with a beard. You know, he has angels with harps and clouds. Like, well, we're on the same page. I don't believe in that kind of God either. Right? Be more specific. You know, is it a personal God who created everything and redeems people, or is it a impersonal force that animates the universe? What are we talking about here? Like, I just are we on the same page? No. And I'm like filling in a bunch of stuff of like possible answers. But notice, if all you do is just ask a question, then they give a response. And you don't have to say anything. All you have to do is question. And it gets the conversation started. Um, the next one. Who are we to say Christianity is better than any other religion? I think the essence of Jesus' teaching is love, same as all religions it's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe there's like there's a bunch of claims <laughs> a bunch of claims so what's one of the claims that the all religions are the same well if that's true why are there so many They might have an answer for that. They might be like, well, different cultures interpret nature in a different way, and that's why they came up with the different blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay. Really? Yeah, is the essence of Jesus teaching love? Ah, okay. So then what do you mean by love? So if the essence of Jesus' teaching is love, what do you mean by that? But did Jesus ever talk about judgment? All the time, right? <laughs> but it could be a it could be like, oh, well, you you say the essence of Jesus' teaching is love. Where did you learn that? If they're making a claim about Jesus and something that he teaches, where did you get that from? And if they don't have, here's the chapter and verse that I got it from, it's like, oh, you don't know who Jesus is. Okay, I got to take a few steps back. Talk about who Jesus is. But from the answer of that question, I can kind of see where they're at, what's going on. All you have to do is ask, what do you mean by love? Well, being kind to people. Okay. Like, well, I remember Jesus in Matthew 23 saying some really harsh things to hypocritical religious people. 
It wasn't very kind. Is that what you mean by love? And if, if that's the case, then Jesus isn't loving? But I thought that was the essence. You see, like, you, like is that what you meant? Well, no, that's, or yes, that's, that's exactly what I mean. I don't think we should read Matthew 23. Okay, I mean, you know, they could answer any way, or a lot of different ways, but you just get some information, and then maybe it leads to another question. Yeah, the essence of teaching is love. Is that all he taught? Didn't Jesus teach about judgment? Notice these are all, these are all questions, right? Trying to elicit answers out of the other person. Uh, yeah, yeah, if all religions are the same, why are there? And remember, the context of this was a weekly Bible study group. They're going over the Great Commission. And Tammy, you, yeah, you, you're like, who gave the Great Commission? <laughs> right? What do you mean we should? How did, yeah, since Jesus gave the Great Commission, what do you think Jesus thought about other religions? That they weren't the right way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, not, not me, but Jesus. Right? And then the last one. You guys see the problem with the last, last statement? Not our job to tell other people how to live or believe. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why? Right. Every, everybody influences everybody else on how to live and how to believe. But specifically, and I think you're, <laughs> I think you might be pointing out. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the gospel. But I am serving. By a lot of witnesses, are you people? And I, when I that position, job. No. my job is to you're going to choose to do it. Exactly. My yeah. job isn't affect, but just right. So the the witnessing conversation has three parties. There's you, the person witnessing. There's the other person you're trying to witness to. And then there's the Holy Spirit. Your job is to, like your task is to go into all the world and what? Make disciples. Make disciples. Teaching them everything that Jesus taught. That's what you're supposed to You're supposed to bear witness to the resurrection. Jesus came back from the dead and that changes everything. All of it. Right? And when you bear witness to that, that's, that's your task. Share that truth. You have no responsibility and no power to change someone's heart. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit can take that truth that you verbalize to the other person and drive it into their heart. Now, if their heart is really hard, it's not going to go very deep. And sometimes their objections that they have to the gospel are what you need to unearth or break up the ground with these questions and then once you understand where they're at then maybe this is a maybe the seed can get in there and maybe produce but you're not going to know what kind of ground you're dealing with unless you get some more information where you ask these questions yes sir. Yep, 
Right. That's what. And that's God's job. It's not my job. Mm-hmm. Maybe even plucking some weeds it, to extend yeah. the analogy to arguments and stuff. Um, so, one, th- one thing I want you to notice about this last statement, it's self-defeating. It's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe, but he's actively telling you <laughs> how to live and what to believe. That he's telling you he has a theology, but Jesus, the essence of Jesus' teaching is love. Like he's he's trying to influence what you believe. But yet he's telling you it's wrong that it's self-defeating. Right? He thinks people ought to live in love or live by love and not judgment. But that in and of itself is a judgment. So, like, oh, maybe you should think about that. Yes. So in... My personality... Right. I think I think uh I think you do that by or rather than using a statement, use action. So like he makes a statement. It's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe. There we go. So is what you're saying telling me how to live? Notice how I said that? Like it was, it was a question. It wasn't like, if I made it a statement, it's like, well, you're just telling me how to live by that statement. And I put a little English on that on purpose. So that way it felt more threatening. But, you know, even if you said that statement in a way, like you, they don't think that for themselves. So like if they already have this wall up, it's going to bounce off the wall. But when you ask a question, then they have to think of a response. Then they have to put that into their own thinking, and then come up with a response. But the way you deliver that question really, really matters. So we're going to have to skip the next two. <clears throat> um, maybe, we'll, uh, maybe we'll do them next week. All right, so here's what we're doing. We're noticing when a person makes a claim, and then we're applying the question, what do you mean by that, in order to acquire more information about their claim. That's what this first question does. And it gets you into the conversation. Pokal says in his book, it's the simplest tactic imaginable to stop a challenger in her tracks, turn the tables, get her thinking a virtually effortless way of putting you in the driver's seat of the conversation. Again, you don't have to say anything. The other person has to come up with a response to the question. It might be wild. You might have no idea where to go after they give their response. Holy cool. Maybe the next time you talk to them, the Holy Spirit will open up a different door, a different set of questions. Maybe you'll never see them again. Remember, you're just taking a step and reassessing. When you ask this question, this is the benefits of this tactic. You're politely inviting people to talk about what they think. How often do you get asked about what you think and believe? Probably not super often. So it can be really engaging if it's done in a polite way, (laughs) right? And you're gathering information, right? It allows you to understand where they're coming from and uh, keeps you from jumping to conclusions. If you hear their claim and then you assume the definition of something within their claim, you might jump to a wrong conclusion. Asking a clarifying question give you more information and keep you from doing that. They're like, you're misrepresenting my point. Like, oh, well, here's some model questions that you could follow up with. Like, let me see if I understand you correctly. Repeat their claim. That right. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay, well then, what did you mean by this or that or whichever part you want to pick out of the claim? Correct me if I'm wrong. But what I heard you say is this, then they have a chance to correct you. 
You don't jump to any conclusions. It keeps the conversation going. Right? It's, it's not threatening because you're not telling them what they said. They're telling you what they said. And then it's like, cool, I, I think I understand what you mean. Have you thought about, and it just leads to a different question. It allows you to make progress, and this is what you were talking about, Joel. It allows you to make progress on a point without being pushy, preachy. That's the benefit of, of the tactics, right, of what Coco's talking about. Notice, you're not stating your own view. You have no responsibility to say anything about anything you believe. Why? Because it's a question. And they have to give the response. Now, if they ask you about what you believe, then you should be gracious and give a response. But notice, when you ask a question, it doesn't require you to say what your opinion on the matter is at all. The last one was about separation of church and state. And you know, it's like, it might not even necessarily be <coughs> gospel related, it be some political issue. It could be a conversation that you're having with your husband or wife, or with your kid. Like, it could be, this is super applicable to every aspect of conversation, right? You don't have to state your own view. And you're not necessarily disagreeing with their view. You're just trying to get more information to understand. As long as you're relaxed and cordial, mild and inquisitive, sincere, friendly and curious, then the conversation will continue. But when you start getting more, when you start making statements, eventually you're gonna to have to make some statements. But if you start off with questions and it's in this kind of attitude, from a humble attitude of trying to learn, then the conversation will continue. They might see right through it and start firing questions of their own. Okay, well, all right, okay. <laughs> We're getting somewhere. And you're not required to give, like, who says you have to give your view? I mean, if they ask, then sure, by all means. You might say, oh, they might say, make a claim. And you just go, oh, that's interesting. What do you mean by whatever it is? What do you mean by separation of church and state? What do you mean by that? Is that a phrase referring to protecting the government from the influence of the church or protecting religious freedom by prohibiting the government from creating an official religion? What do you mean? The latter one is what it actually means. You'd have to know that. Anyways, be patient, be alert for if the person becomes uneasy. Then change, maybe change around the questions. No one's asked you a question about your view. You're not required to give it. Just gathering information. And this takes all the pressure off. Wondering? If you're like, oh, I feel really uncomfortable going any further. Cool. The next time you'll be able to take another step and reassess. That's the first question. We'll get to the other two examples next week. All right, let's. Recording.